This summer, game developer Strange Scaffold released Click Holding, a game which, given two seconds of contemplating the title, you could probably guess the premise of. You play as someone desperate for money, stuck in a hotel room with a masked man who promises to give you said money, so long as you click 10,000 times on a little clicker device. It's a completely fine game, though I didn't much like its ending, with an easy to understand gameplay loop that progresses linearly with each click of your mouse. I think it starts out strong, leaning heavily on the juxtaposition of its silly conceit with a serious tone, weakening toward the end as it doesn't quite stick the dismount. Despite my lukewarm response to its story, I've been thinking about clickholding for a while now, because I can't get over its primary verb. Whether you hold down the spacebar or hammer away at your mouse, you can't get through this game without hitting that 10,000 mark. It's repetitive, it's frustrating, it's such a comically simple mechanic that the whole subgenre of idle games spawned from its variations. And yet, I think it kind of rules as a game design choice. It is both basic and uninteresting, to the point that you would be justified in asking, why play this game at all? But for some reason, I blazed headlong into it, absolutely determined to win. So when I discovered Elliot Davis's Journey of 1000 Zips in September, I was equally entranced. Zips describes itself as an exercise in futility. The game's itch.io page features a cascade of blue and white file folders compressed into each other, presumably 1,000 times. When you download the game, it's exactly what you'd expect, a .zip file named 1000. The itch.io store page also features a wall of shame, the names of the stubborn few who meticulously dug their way through each folder and confirmed to Davis that they had, indeed, beaten his game. From September until mid-November, I became obsessed with joining their ranks. For whatever reason, perhaps a trick of Windows 11, or perhaps my own inability to wrangle with my computer, I couldn't figure out how to progress past folder 950. Davis warned me that the infrastructure of some operating systems frowned upon the Matryoshka doll of files he'd constructed, and even though I followed his instructions to get around this error, my computer would not let me continue. It wasn't until I had the bright idea to attempt zips using the file navigator on my phone that I could push forward. It made the process slower, more finicky, as both my phone's limited processor and my makeshift method of saving my progress were anathema to the design of the iPhone, but I was ecstatic. I was going to beat this stupid game. Having now completed this challenge, I can confirm it is, indeed, a stupid game. Hell, in the little notes hidden in the file folders throughout, Davis himself laments the idea as he works through the grueling process of generating and zipping up a thousand folders. But Davis also makes clear that, reluctantly or otherwise, he does consider this to be a role-playing game. And I don't know if that's true necessarily. The only role I played throughout Zips was that of an increasingly frantic YouTuber mining rock bottom for content. But Journey of a Thousand Zips is absolutely a game, and I think there's something worth interrogating in the implicit challenge of its existence. Probably the only other indie game that comes close to Zips is Adira Slattery's Feedback, in which players are tasked with completing a series of surveys while drawing 25 chairs over increasingly short time periods. Slattery's experience is somewhat more focused, with the framework of survey collection and submission providing more structure than Davis's folders. But the repetitive task of drawing a bunch of chairs has the same appeal to me. Perhaps it's the shrinking time frame that increases the intensity of the chair drawing experience, Perhaps it's Slattery's sincere hope that someone completes the gauntlet and sends her their final survey. But outside of whatever intellectual challenge it may pose, feedback is a demanding game. It is not easy to print 27 pieces of paper, block off two hours of your one wild and precious life, and spend them sweating over chairs, no matter what creative epiphany about time, effort, and resources you might have along the way. And Zips isn't even trying to produce that kind of effect. Nevertheless, I think works that ask players to willingly beat their heads against a wall are, for some reason, fascinating. To give words to what I might find compelling about games like this, I did some reading. Shoutouts to Drs. Skandra and Johnson who sent me their research papers on grinding and repetition. The field of video game studies has devoted significant energy to discussing what I like to call suffering games, and I wanted to see what much smarter people than me had to say on the subject. My very brief foray into academia brought up three lenses which might explain what zips and feedback are doing. Grinding, frustration, and ritual logic. In Sabrina Skandra's paper, Fight, Heal, Repeat, 
a look at rhetorical devices in grinding game mechanics. Scandera discusses how the mechanic of grinding is implemented across various genres of video game, typically because doing so rewards the player. Grinding is a repetitive activity, typically one in which players are killing enemies, repeating levels, or otherwise performing a task with a small percentage chance of yielding a certain outcome. By encouraging players to engage in this sort of repetitive behavior, games can create emotional arcs tied to narrative progression, as is the case in supergiant games Hades. Between narrative and mechanical incentives, grinding is encouraged, and the player is rewarded for their effort. In this way, I think the grind of games like Zips and Feedback makes sense. You play the game the way the designers intended, you follow the planned narrative beats, and achieve the reward of having completed the game, despite how difficult the designers told you the process would be. Daniel Johnson's research is interested in the frustration produced by that difficulty, as he outlines in the paper, Animated Frustration or the Ambivalence of Player Agency. Though Johnson is using a janky Kinect game and Papers, Please as points of comparison, he highlights universal aspects of difficulty and repetition that I think slot well into this conversation. He first outlines the notion that difficulty, as a game tool, is important because it allows players to gauge how challenge, effort, and reward will be meted out over the course of a game experience, a notion that I intuitively believed, but only clicked once I saw it spelled out on paper. Johnson goes on to describe how a game's repetition, whether intentional, as is the case in Papers, Please, or unintentional, as with Steel Battalion Heavy Armor, creates frustration that limits how a player is able to engage with the work. Steel Battalion's laughable connect functionality makes players feel like nothing they do matters, since its similar motion inputs result in seemingly random actions. But Papers, Please uses repetitive game mechanics on purpose, both simulating the feeling of working at a dead-end bureaucratic job, as well as making players feel like their available verbs are restricted along with the game's narrative possibility space. These concepts align with the zips and feedback pretty accurately. Zips especially produced a great deal of frustration for me due to my inability to run it on my computer. Like Steel Battalion's janky controls, I felt like I couldn't appropriately engage with the game due to technical error. I suspect, the repetition of drawing a chair over and over again in feedback, especially when timed, creates stress and frustration at having to fill out a survey multiple times, each time trying to figure out what new responses to add, and more than likely, resulting in players adding short responses or even responses copied verbatim from previous surveys. The constraints of the game produce frustration, which in itself limits player agency. The key difference between Johnson's research and Davis and Slattery's works, however, is that the frustration is the point. Despite the fact that the repetitive nature and technical limitations of both games disincentivizes play, I think that hostility toward the consumer is part of the fun. When Davis names file folders things like Turn Back and embrace the suffering, Davis is posing a challenge to the player, daring them to continue onward despite the work's intentionally aggravating design. Allison Gazzard and Alan Peacock's Repetition and Ritual Logic in Video Games gave me my favorite insight into the appeal of suffering games. The paper discusses how a broader understanding of rituals can be applied in video games, which I think can be extrapolated to zips and feedback. Gazzard and Peacock establish a few cornerstones of ritual. Ritual is necessarily ludic. Ritual involves repetition in incantation, recitation, the use of objects, the making of gestures. Ritual may be witnessed or it may be performed. In the playing of zips and feedback, one is engaging in ritual-like behavior. I can't tell you how many times I tapped on my screen in a semi-conscious trance, or maybe just half asleep, to open and unopen those stupid files. But by seeking out and attempting this repetition in the context of a game, I gave the action significance. Gazzard and Peacock also cite Rebecca Solnit's ideas on pilgrimage, how the journey toward a goal can take on heightened meaning. Zips posits itself as a journey by name alone, and when you bring the idea that this sort of repeated progression can be a kind of pilgrimage, I think it allows us to view the work as a near metaphysical experience. By purposefully seeking out the boring, repetitive, actively antagonistic framework of this game, Players embark on a pilgrimage, perform the ritual of opening and unzipping hundreds of file folders, such that it does not really matter where the journey ends, only that the work which we have imbued with meaning was carried out. I think these games, clickholding, zips, feedback, all engage with aspects of grinding, frustration, and ritual. 
These three lenses help me conceptualize why I find their repetitive gameplay compelling. It is the inherent challenge of the grind, the frustration which the games force you to contend with, the slow methodical progress that in itself becomes important, that creates a feeling of triumph at their conclusion. Though, triumph over a self-made obstacle hardly seems appropriate. You don't get a medal for running 26 miles on your own. Do you? This year, I learned of a comedian and streamer by the name of Tom Walker. While an accomplished comic in his own right, I've fallen in love with his series on Grand Theft Auto 4, where he attempts to complete the game's main story with a mod that maxes out car speed. The outcomes of such an endeavor are predictable and hilarious. The number of deaths he's endured on singular missions often reaches triple digits. It looks like agony. When the mod makes even the task of crossing the street a challenge, it makes me wonder, fondly, what is wrong with this man? And it's not just GTA. Walker has similarly created real-world challenges for himself with no meaningful goal, outside of Twitch and YouTube revenue. Probably the most galling is his attempt to flip 10 heads on a coin in a row, an 8-hour marathon which he complicated by adding a rule that, should he flip 10 tails in a row first, he would have to increase his head's streak by 1, which of course happened 2 hours into the attempt. Walker's work absolutely hits on all three lenses I described earlier. The probability of flipping 10 heads in a row is 1 in a 1,000, which means it's mathematically feasible to do so, it's just a matter of grinding out the attempts. Similarly, the GTA missions are beatable, but managing the number and location of cars spawning requires luck on top of knowledge of the game's generative procedures. The constant repetition of missions, as well as coin flips, creates frustration, certainly. But again, the frustration is the point of these spectacles. Daniel Johnson explicitly cites the phenomenon of Twitch streamers playing annoying and clunky games for their audience, calling attention to the fact that these grueling challenges are very much labor, transforming audience attention into income. It's work, in a very literal sense. And when things get especially hectic, Walker dips into magical thinking, projects ritual logic onto the game, starts believing that certain phrases... Gimme Lizzie! Have you been saying that? No. Gimme Lizzie! No, I've not been saying gimme Lizzie. Gimme Lizzie! No, I don't like that at all. Well, it gave me Lizzie. <laughs> or loudly, desperately singing the kid Leroy and Justin Bieber's stay. If I do the same thing, I never know if I ever would. I told you I'd change, even though I knew I never could. We'll be rewarded by the game and allow progression to continue. But in an interview with Aftermath, Walker makes the most honest summary of why he plays games in this manner. I get the idea in my head that I will defeat stupid challenges that don't matter pretty often," Walker said. To me, one of the most human things you can do is commit yourself to a challenge that doesn't matter, that only you care about, and that you could stop doing at any time. If life is suffering, why not choose more suffering, and more life? I think that statement boils down why I'm enthralled by suffering games. There's nothing funnier, and in a sense, more authentic, to me than setting up a challenge for no other reason than it would be hard to do. And I love that designers like Elliot Davis and Adira Slattery have tapped into that impulse, leaned into the inherent silliness of choosing to inflict tedium and frustration upon oneself. They show us that the indie RPG scene is constantly pushing the boundaries of the medium, angling us closer to performance art than dungeon crawling. The end goal of these games is not profit, but the unglamorous experience of doing something for a bit, trying to invent their own meaning along the way. I am so grateful to be in a space where designers are brave and funny, enough to challenge us to embark on their pointless journeys. Thank you to everybody for watching. I really appreciate anyone who takes the time to see what I'm saying about tabletop games. Uh, if you want to help me keep the channel going, you can send me a tip at my Ko-Fi in the video description. My background picture is liquefied image by Adrian on Unsplash. My profile picture is by Eater Outsider on Tumblr. If you want to find more of my work, I'm at AAVoit on Blue Sky. Monster Factory fanfic on Tumblr, but my main site is aavoid.com, where I talk about games and writing. I also do a podcast that's Mortified the Friendship Quest, where me and my friend Layla do critical media analysis. Uh, we'll be talking about The Wizard of Oz and Wicked when this uh, video goes up. Uh, so check us out. Uh, I think that'll be a really good conversation. Thanks again for watching. Uh, until next video, see ya.